scripture says in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Think about that a minute. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd. Amen? Hallelujah. I shall not want. He make a bed to lie down in green pastures. He lived me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. Yes,
Not the blood of another individual, only the blood of Jesus. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. But oh, that precious blood flowed down Calvary. It changed the universe. You and I who had no hope. Praise God, I've got hope tonight. Hope beyond this world. Even though we look at the glass darkly, one day we're going to know as we're known. We're going to understand all things by and by. What a day it's going to be. Give me one more praise before you see it. He is an awesome God, worthy of our praise and honor. The Lord has put in my spirit to not a message talking about life and blood. I trust that you understand about how important the blood really is. You know, in the blood, that's where the life is. As long as you've got blood flowing in your body, you're living. It stops flowing, you cease to be. And it's amazing that when God created us, that He created not only men and women different, and I'm not talking about the cause of female and male, He put in men more blood than He put in women. When I read that, I thought, now how is that possible? But then I read a little further the medical explanation because men's skeletal frame has more muscle normally than women do. It takes more blood not to break it. Oh, well, that's interesting. But you know, one thing I've learned, no matter if you man or woman, you've got just enough. Just enough. Not too much, not too little. Just enough. And it's that blood that keeps us moving. When we're young, we talk about being hot-blooded. You know, oh, women don't bother. And we got the T-shirt. Remember them days? Some of you? Some of you still there? I'm not. And as I get older, the blood gets thinner or something that was good. I don't know what else to do. But now I can sit around with a long sleeve shirt on and don't bother me at all. Or you do, just a t-shirt would burn me up. So the body changes. But the blood of Jesus never changes. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The psalm said that reaches to the highest mountain and reaches to the lowest depths. No matter where you have to use the blood, it's always there. I'm going to trust God to help us to look into the scripture. See how important the blood really is. Not only in the physical realm, but in the spirit realm. It's the blood that makes the difference. You see, people don't preach about the blood much anymore. They don't want to talk about the blood. They want a socially acceptable gospel. They want something where everybody feel good and jump about and have a great time. And we just go away, we'll be, and hallelujah, and all that stuff, and that's good. But I'm telling you, you need the blood. The blood. Be a lot. Because the blood makes the way sin. The cleansing from all unrighteousness is the blood. I don't know where I'm going this tonight, I'll be honest with you. The Lord's given us some stuff. I don't know where we're going. I thought, I had a lot of notes this morning, but I don't think I need about three scriptures. I all them on okay. One thing I learned about God, when God sent you somewhere, you just hang on to the right. Amen. Because it's a good right. I don't know what God's doing in and God's doing something to make y'all pray. I know y'all been praying because I'm telling you some different things are going on. But in the Word of God, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, we find where we are at a time where God is getting ready to deliver His people. They've been in bondage 407 years. God has put plague upon plague upon Egypt and they each time thou said, still won't let go. I thought it amazing how God and His love and mercy, He'll do something and try to change us. If we don't change it, then He's got to do something a little more drastic. Well, if that don't work, then He has to do something even more drastic. So finally He gets to our attention, and here we find in the Scripture, the tenth plague was the most drastic of all. Firstborn of every house of Egypt. They rode down to the slowest slave. Every animal, sheep, donkeys, camels, dromedaries, oxen, all firstborn died. <coughs> Thank my, what would they do then? But 
And I'm telling you, we're living in a day and a time that we need to realize that we're on our way to dying more than we are living in the natural realm. Because from the time you take your first breath, you're on the process of taking your last breath. We don't know where that last breath is. We hope it's way out there somewhere. We don't know that. So it's not necessarily the beginning or the end that we spend a lot of time concerned about. We need to really be concerned about what happens in the middle. Because what happens in the middle is going to prepare him what's going to happen to him. That's going to take blood. And our sin will give you nothing but the cross will give you all things. The word of God said in verse 5. Talking about taking a lamb, your lamb shall be without blemish. I read that, I said, well, there's that word again, God. Blemish. Any imperfection. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it evening. And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, wherein they shall eat it. I want to share with you about life and the blood and what a difference the blood makes tonight. Would you pray for me? Ask God one more time to have drink tonight. Father, I thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you for your blessings and abundant grace that you shed upon your people. We are a privileged people. Let us never, ever take it for granted. But let us give glory and honor unto you this day. For your righteousness and your holy. Your name is to be exalted. You're to be lifted up. You're to be praised. You're to be glorified in the midst of the congregation of the righteous. You said in your word, let me in your word lift up holy hands. Lord, as an act of surrender to you, so we lift them up tonight and say, I surrender. I put myself in your hands, O oh God. You may speak to me the things that you want to do to me, what you want to do. This thing's not about me, but it is about you. And I come to bless your people tonight. Flow to me, O oh God. Find every force of hell and every power of darkness and every influence of the not of God. Bring into subjection all those spirits that would stand against you. Let the heart of the people be open and free, not only to receive the word of God, but let the ears be born and hear. Let us apply it to our lives that we may be changed in Jesus' name. We'll give you the glory and the honor forever. And amen. 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 You know, in reading about the people in bondage, what they had to go through was a hard time. It's interesting that when we read the Word of God, we have to understand that everything in the Word of God is symbolic of what is yet to come. Here we find talking about the people in bondage. Man's been in bondage ever since Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. In fact, you read about Adam and Eve and said, uh, when they had done the things they had done, some of them realized they were naked. And they hid themselves in the bushes. And God had to kill animals and give them coverings of skin. You cover them up with the animal. So there was the first blood living there. And all down through time we find where the blood is always the answer for every situation. Under the old covenant we find where the Lord told Moses that you're to offer up to me burnt sacrifices of the blood. Whatever you do, don't eat the blood. Because life is in the blood. Eat the meat, but don't eat the blood. Pour that blood out upon the mercy seat. Because when you begin to pour that blood out, I will hear you, and I will respond, say the Lord. Yes, and so we know how the old covenant went, but you know, we don't live under the old covenant. We live under the new covenant, the new testament, if you will, where Jesus Christ is my Passover lamb. Where he is that perfect one without blemish. Up to this point, man had tried and tried and tried to conquer sin in his life, but no matter how hard he tried, he could never do it because he would always find himself falling back into that same position that he was trying to get out of. It's kind of like one of those deals, I take one step up, then I take two steps back. But I never quit trying to take that step up. Because I believe and I'm committed to the fact of the Word of God that He's going to move in my behalf and He's going to help me to get through every obstacle and every situation that I have to face, not by who I am, but by who He is. By the strength and the power that there is in Him. We find the Word of God tells us about Jesus that He hung on the cross. Before He went to that cross, the Scripture tells me that He took stripes on His back for your healing and for mine. He wanted us to be healed. He expects us to be healed. In fact, 
The first Peter, I believe, was talked about by his right to you were healed. Now, are healed, going to be healed, could be. You were healed. It was taken care of way back on Calvary. Before they nailed him to the cross, that blood ran out of his back, down his back, down his legs, leaving bloody footprints, taking him to the cross of Calvary so that you and I may live in divine health and strength and favor for the glory of God. <laughs> but it was the blood that ran that made the difference. It's not water. It's blood. It's not when we read in the Word of God, one of the plagues that came upon the people of Egypt, that how all their water was turned to blood. They couldn't drink it. The frogs died. It began to stink, and indeed it does. But the blood that had life in it was what was necessary to offer to God because God respected the blood. When Jesus offered himself on Calvary, he, re he respected that in Jesus, but yet at the same time, because he took the sins of you and me upon him, he had to turn his back on him for a while because he could not look upon his son. It's no wonder that he cried from the cross, crying aloud, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I was reading the other day about so many different ideas and thoughts that people have. One of the things that I read about is talking about one group believes that Jesus is in hell today. That he's chained to the wall of hell and he's still crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me in the devil's torment? And I'm telling you, that's not true. Amen. According to the word of God, he went to hell for three days. He preached this mighty gospel to those who were held captive. And as he began to preach to them, some believed and some didn't and make you ask the question, well, if a man's in hell, why in the world would he want to get out? Well, let me tell you, it's just like it's always been. Some believe and some won't. Some want to do this and some want to do that. But I'm telling you, when the blood of Jesus flowed from Calvary's brow, everything that man ever thought or had ever even began to comprehend changed on that day. Because when that precious blood flowed down Calvary's side, that blood brought the remission of sin for you and I. The Word of God says that I can now come boldly to the throne of grace and seek Him in all that I have need of because He is faithful and just to hear me. But for the time that this happened, you couldn't come into the church house uh, like you can to mine. You couldn't come and sit in here and enjoy the music and the singing and the preaching and all these things. You'd have to stand out in the yard and listen to someone uh, ministry for you. You'd have to give your uh, sacrifice, your offering to the priest. And, and he'd come in and out of court. But he could only come into the holies of holies one time a year. In other words, he'd come to the altar. That's the mercy seat in case you don't go. Let me tell you, you can come to the mercy seat any time you want to now. You don't have to have a pastor to bring the party. You can get up and walk down the aisle and make up in an old-fashioned altar and begin to pour your heart out to God like you've never poured it out before. He who is faithful and just will meet you at your need tonight. In Matthew 26 and 28, the Word of God said, For this is my blood of my two testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. When Jesus had his disciples together in what we call the last supper of the Lord's Supper, as he gave them of the cup, he said, Take drink, this is the blood of the New Testament. You see, he wanted them to understand that even though the blood had been shed yet, it was about to be shed. He knew that the one who sat with him at the table was about to go and betray him and go set it out. He knew that time of trouble was coming on him. He knew this time by which he had come up on the face of this earth was fixing the climax. He knew the time that he had spent looking for the day and the hour, knowing why he was here at Calvary, knowing why he was going to face a cruel, wicked cross. He knew that he's going to have to go through some stuff for you and I. But thank God he was willing to go through what he did so that you and I no longer had to go through it. We could not help ourselves. We needed someone more than we ever needed help in our life. You and I could not save ourselves, but Jesus Christ could save us. We find that blood in the old way just covered over, but thank God he brought the remission, he brought the cleansing, he brought the taking away of my sins. The word of God said the cause of the sin of the first Adam entered in the world by the second Adam. Sin was remitted and put under the blood. It's no wonder that when we begin to think about the blood of Jesus, how he can take a black heart and apply red blood to it and make it pure or white. I don't know how that works because I know in the natural laws of things, you take black and red, put them together, you get purple. But I know in this case you get white because he takes and touches us in the depths of our being. The word of God said he cleanses me from all unrighteousness. He said, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me that I may have life and I may have it more abundantly. But let me tell you something tonight. Without Jesus, there is no hope. 
without Jesus, we have a life and have more money. Amen. Amen. Is Jesus hung on that cross of Calvary? Is he hung there in the blood, oozing out of his body? And I know a lot of people don't want to talk about that because that's how I don't want to talk about a bloody anything, but that's the way it was. Jesus was beaten almost beyond recognition. In fact, the word of God, Isaiah, when you read about it, is that his message being his facial features, his outward features were so grotesque the man didn't even want to look at him. His face was swelled, his eyes were swelled, his mouth was busted, hair plucked out by hand, bulls, just bloody roots come out. They plucked his beard out, just bloody places all over him. They beat him, they spit on him, they kicked him, they mocked him, they did everything you can imagine. Yet, in all these things, he never sinned. He never brought accusation against them. In fact, he let that happen to go to the cross. And if you read the word of God, as he hung on that cross of Calvary, the word of God says that he hung there suspended between heaven and earth. And he looked down and saw his friends. And he saw some of his followers. And he saw the church leaders. And he saw the soldiers. And he saw the mark, uh, those that mocked him and all these different type of people. Yet in all these things, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I thought so many times when I read that scripture, what would have happened had they realized what was going on? Would they crucify the king of glory or would they have lifted him up and tried to put him on the throne? And Satan understood the impact of what he was doing. He would not have crucified Jesus. He would not have shed his blood. But he did because he didn't know the end result of what's about to happen. But I'm telling you this day, this thing is already won on our behalf of Jesus Christ. When he shed that blood on Calvary and he said, it is finished, it was over, it was done, it was finished. We haven't got there yet, but we're getting there. The word of God tells me in the book of Revelation, there's going to be those that stand in his presence. And say, how Lord, oh Lord, how Lord, oh Lord, oh, how long, oh Lord, before we shed the blood that you're going to take and minister back to these people who have done these things to us. The word of God says there's going to be countless scores of people there who have given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, who have been martyred over the centuries among centuries, who have made that determination that I'm going to be what Jesus wants me to be. I'm not going to back up, head up, or I'm going to quit. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm not going to repent that I'm a child of God because I'm convinced that He's able to keep that which I've been doing. Yes, amen. But that fits all about the blood. Amen. The blood of Calvary. We sing so many songs. Like some of my sister Joanne to sing some of those songs that are meant more about the blood. And all through the Word of God, I find the blood. You can't get along without the blood. Amen. It takes the blood of Jesus to still cleanse us. It takes the blood of Jesus to still purify us. It takes the blood of Jesus to cover us. I don't know yeah. about you, but many times when I pray over a situation, I just cover myself yeah. in the blood. Because I know if I'm get under the blood, I know Satan can't find me. Yeah. When the blood is applied, I'm in a high place. So I mean, they, they, they do a lot of things. He may threaten you. He may push you. He may punish you. But oh, when that bloodline appears, I'm telling you, that puts a stop to it right quick. He goes in the panic mode because he knows what the blood will do. He knows that the blood will cleanse you. He knows the blood will change you. He knows the blood will purify you. He knows the blood will make you holy. God has always got that memory for you and I. That's through Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. I think about Abraham reading about him in the scripture when the Lord told him, He said, I want you to go up. I want you to take Isaac. You know, some Isaac. You want you to offer those burnt offering. You know, when you read the scripture, and I wondered about this, it just says that he got up and got busy about the Lord. I thought to myself, if the Lord had told me to do that to one of my kids, I would just wouldn't have jumped up. I don't think I, we didn't have a conversation. Now, Lord, hold on me. Did you say for me to take my child, the child you gave me? The child of my old age, the child that is the joy of my life, the promised child. Did I hear you right? Did you say, offer him up as a sacrifice? I don't know that he did that, but I think he would. But yet I think he also went with that point saying, I know the Lord has a plan. Amen. All these years of getting me here, he got me here, so if he get me here, he keep me. And the word of God says they went to the land of the mountains there and he began to go to offer sacrifice to the young man. You stay here, me and the voice going on to offer sacrifice. So as he got there, he said he took the wood and put up on him. I was reading and thinking about this and I thought, well, that's interesting. He put the wood on him. He gave him the fire. He gave him the knife. And the voice said, Isaac said, Father, where's the sacrifice? He said, God, where's he was prophesying Jesus yet to come. 
But as I was thinking about that, I said, God, how does that relate to me? And he began to speak in my spirit. This is what he said. He said, the wood is the elder. Because that's what the wood was for, was to build an He said, I must have an altar above all else. My people need an altar to be able to go to. He said, the fire is my spirit that I'm going to pour out in this last day. That I'm going to begin to pour out on your sons and daughters, your maid servants, your men servants. I'm going to begin to move in them in such a fashion. They'll begin to prophesy and declare the word of the Lord. Those who haven't been moved in forever, it seemed like, suddenly are going to begin to move. Those who seem so unconcerned, I'm going to move on them in such a fashion, they're going to begin to open their mouth and prophesy what thus said the word of God. So we had the wood and the fire. What was the knife for? The knife was for the killing, the destroying of the human body. But I'm telling you, there's another knife out there. That God uses for the night, that's the sword of the word. That word, that word, that word. It cuts me one way and then it'll cut me another way. But you know, it don't kill me. It cuts me. It takes out some junk. It moves some stuff around. The Lord is always watching. And when you get this word in you, and you begin to let this word take root in your heart, you begin to declare this word over you, then that word will begin to do something in your life. And as that word begins to work, the blood will show up. And it will cover you because when he got there, he said that he looked around and see the offering, but Abraham said, God will provide. And all of a sudden he heard a noise and the brown was looked around and the old sheep was caught by his horns. Someone said one time, well, I guess God formed him while he was up. I don't know if he formed him while he was up earth and running up the mountain. I don't know what he did. All I know is he was there. Amen. And it said they took offering as a sacrifice of the Lord, and the Lord accepted that sacrifice. He was able to go back home with the son of Isaac, who became the nation that God said would be. Let me tell you, God never promises anything that He won't carry through on. But you and I, who are of the covenant, and that covenant is that New Testament covenant, that we are in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, where He said, But if you are in that covenant relationship, because of the atonement, healing can be in your body. Deliverance can be in your soul. You can have a peace of mind where there's no fear. There's no anxiety that troubles you and pushes you to the point that you don't know what you're going to do from day to day. But even in the midst of all that stuff, there can be a calm in the midst of the storm. Simply because the blood was supplied. You see, without blood, you won't last very long. When a person dies, you know what they take out of them? The blood. When a person's in bond, the blood's been taken out. So the body of mess. But in the spiritual man, the enemy of hell is trying to kill us. He's trying to take the blood out of us. But I'm telling you what, my Redeemer still lives. The blood still flows. It's still coming from Calvary tonight, just like it did 2,000 years ago. It has not diminished, it has not lost its power. It will never lose its power. It is still the blood. It's still the shed blood for the remission of sin. It's still knowing that He is God. He is the one who shed His blood for you and I. He's the one who puts His stripes, as I said on His back. And Him is everything you have need of. Because whatever blood He shed was for you and for me tonight. Amen? Amen. I think about that old song. I looked it up while I go and listen to him singing on the, on the internet. My hope is built on nothing less. But Jesus' blood and His righteousness. In other words, I don't need to put my faith in nothing but Him. Amen. No matter what I build it on, as long as I build it on Him. I think of a man that the Bible talks about two men, a wise man and a foolish man. The foolish man built his house upon the sand and built it upon care of the life and built it upon the things of everyday living. And said the storm came as well. When the storm came, it said it poured his house down and great was the fall thereof. But the wise man built his house on the rock. The rock is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, if you're going to build a house and I build it on Jesus. Amen. And it said that as he built that house on that rock, the same storms, the same problems, the same troubles come to him that came to this other man. But his house didn't fall. It may have shook. It may have shivered a little bit. It may have rumbled and roared. But when all was said and done, that house was still standing on that firm foundation Jesus Christ. Because when he shed his blood to establish you and I, the 
upon the things of God, we are unmovable if we want to be. That's why the word says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. But it says, the Holy Spirit will nothing less than Jesus' blood, his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly trust in Jesus' name. Amen. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground. The same thing. Same. You're going to be able to do anything good on Jesus tonight. Amen. You're going to trust anything, trust Jesus. Okay. You're going to declare anything, declare Jesus. It's not what you think. It's not what I think. It's not what you feel. It's not what I feel. It's not what somebody told me or somebody told you. But by what does say the word of God, that the fullness of the glory of God is going to work in the midst of the congregation of the church. We who are the people of God have been led out of bondage and out of fear and out of all the things of the enemy. No longer do I live in fear that if the Lord was to come tonight, I would have made it. Because I know now my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I know by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed me from all unrighteousness. He wrote my name in that book. And it's been there for some time, and I intend to keep it there. I don't intend to have it marked out, rubbed out, poured out. But I intend to keep it there where it's been these years. And I don't know how many more years before we'll be standing before him. But when he gets there, he turns that big old book over there and just put it down, find my name. He says, Yes, yeah, your Lord. Lord, have mercy, look down now. <laughs> the blood Amen. has kept me. Yes. The blood has cleansed me. Yes. The blood has done his job. Amen. There's times that in the flesh we get weak. There's times we get tired. There's times we become overwhelmed. But there's something about the blood that will always pull you back. Amen. You know, when the blood pressure gets out of whack, you have all kinds of crazy things about it. You get dizzy. I've never been that way. Stand up there, claim this count. You know, you think, don't think. Blood pressure gets low. Almost the same thing. You can be too high or too low. I had Brian, he's telling me a little bit about the blood pressure. The top part of the number is when your heart pumps out the blood, it pumps under that pressure. But when the heart relaxes to retract and get ready to pump again, it falls to that pressure. So many people say, well, if you've got blood pressure 120 over 80, then you're good. I don't know too many people's got that. Maybe 130 over 85 or whatever. You know, I don't know. But it's something about the blood pressure. We realize if the blood in the natural is not right, something is going to happen. Probably two years ago, maybe it was now, maybe three, not that. Yeah, it's very cold. I think it was six months ago, three years ago. So we kind of <laughs> And I've seen the moments I have every now and then. But I remember one day I thought I had a sinus infection. I felt like I had a sinus infection. I had them before. I heard, well, I'm doing a doctor. I figured that out. I got a sinus infection. I go to the doctor. And I always wonder why they always take blood pressure. You ever notice that first thing to take blood pressure? I wonder what came away from that. But he took my blood pressure and he looked at me real funny. Wondering in order to this. And he looked at me, and I could tell by the look on his face, something's not right here. He said, how do you feel? I said, I'm good, Lord. Are you sure? I said, yeah. Look, I, I'm okay. You don't have to go home and stay in the house for three days. I won't put you on blood pressure. I said, I don't know blood pressure. I said, I ain't got time for that. I've got to go back to the farm. I've got mowing to do. I've got blah. I started naming it off. He said, let me put it to you this way. You either do what I say or by tonight you'll be up here in the hospital with a stroke. Well, he got on did he? I said, no. He said, do you know what your blood pressure is? I said, no. Why? He said, it's 170 over 110. I said, so? What that mean? He said, have you stroke? He said, you go home. I'm going to give you medicine. You go in that house. Don't you come out of that house for three days. Well, I'm going to give you something to think about that. You know, that grass really needed to be mowed. It needed to be mowed that thing. <laughs> Two or three other things I thought really needed to be done, I decided they didn't need to be done that day. And I begin to think about the other side of the point where it said, if you don't go home and do this, you'll be in the hospital for not with a stroke. My mother had a stroke and I saw that come about. And I said, I don't want that. So I decided right quick, I'm early than those. I'm going to go home. And I'm going to do nothing for three days. 
this. And I did. I started taking the medicine and started making me do all kinds of crazy stuff. Crazy and all. I don't say it. Don't say it. But I'd take my medicine and I'd get up out of a chair and when I'd stand up I'd be like this. But I said, what are you going to drink? I didn't drink a medicine. He was trying to get my blood pressure back in that normal way. I mean, I would, I, I, I lay down in the world and do this. You never think about things like that in your life. We just go through life doing whatever we want to, eating whatever we want to, acting like we want to, and when things happen to God, you know I me? Mean? I said, you can me? Heal you when you know better. But he does nothing else. And I remember after about three days, I got to work with Tolerated. I got feeling better. My blood pressure got down about 140 over like 85, I think it was. Ooh, I pretty good. I feel good. About enough. I feel taking it. I'm still taking it today, but I'm going to get off of it. Amen. The reason I'm going to get off of it is because I'm going to follow the rules. I put myself in this mess. But through God's help, I'm going to get out of this mess. And if you're sitting here, and I don't know what I'm saying this morning. It's not what they're going to talk about this, but I'm going to do it. You didn't listen to me. Maybe you're in a place in your life right now that you're on that verge of going too far. The destruction could be waiting you in, it could be setting you up. You let God do the blood. But you need to deliver you. You let Him save you, let Him change you, let Him minister to you. Because I believe you cannot be on a shadow of doubt. He's going to do some work on you. It's always the blood that they check. They want to know you got disease, they take them. They'll check your blood. You got this, this, and you got this, this. Cholesterol's too high. You got too much potassium in you. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I don't know what all that means. I just know it won't sound good. But I'm convinced. <coughs> That the blood of Jesus that yes. cleansed me from all unrighteousness yes. is also my healer and my deliverer tonight. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, this is a little strange, man, Pastor Jim. Yeah. This ain't where I thought I was going. That's the thing you want to read, but I don't want to be directly in your mouth. He says it's time for me to minister to the body. And so did I. I'm going to minister to the body. That's my place. I think God's going to keep sending you down. I see you do some things down. I'm thinking to myself, we'll have to play you here with God's name. You're a good man. Amen. I said, if I thought I'd make you a hill trouble, I said, you couldn't tell it for me. He jumped higher than I can. I don't know how you know that. Woo! Woo! Yeah, you know. You know, we can do everything we can do. The Word of God says do that. We've done all you can to stand in sin and see the salvation of God. You've done all you can. God said, okay, now nobody will get the credit for me. Amen. And when he does it, it's so easy, it's so simple, and suddenly you realize, wow, look at me, okay, what's out here? The word of God says that we're to pray. The prayer of faith. We're to know with all, we're to lay hands on them. And the Lord said, not only will I heal them, but he said, they're committed to sin, I'll forgive them. He has a many whole blessing there. He takes care of everything. So here's where we're going.